Okay, welcome uh, guys to chapter six. And uh, we should have finished Newton laws by now. And there was a question from last time. Does anybody remember the question? Does anyone remember it? Doesn't have to be verbatim, I mean, roughly. Okay, there was no question then. I was wrong, was I? The question for, no, not for the discussion. The question when we were talking about the last chapter, we said something and then I promised something. Why must we move past the third law? That's, that's basically the question from last time. So uh, Samantha nailed it and I think other people too. So basically the point is the following. We learned the first law of Newton, which basically says if an object is under no net forces, that that object will remain at rest, at rest if it was at rest to begin with, or if it was moving, it's going to continue moving with the same speed in the same direction, meaning with the same velocity, okay? On a straight line, basically, that's what uh, in the same direction means. So that's the first law. The second law basically states that now, if that same object is under now net forces, that object will actually change its motion, namely it's going to accelerate. It's going to either gain speed or lose speed, that's what the word accelerate means, or change direction of motion, or the combination, okay? Uh, in such a way that the rate at which the acceleration is happening is proportional actually to the force itself, the more force, the more change in motion you're going to have, and it's also inversely proportional to the inertia of the object. The objects tend to resist change in motion, therefore, uh, the more mass you have, the less change you're going to have in motion. So that's basically what the second law is saying. And we said that that is it, actually. The second law, in terms of calculations, that's what it revolves around, because more or less you can actually go back to the first law using this F equals to MA, that's the formula, basically, how it's usually uh, 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 stated. But as a matter of fact, it's really more of a cause and effect, and it should really be written as A being the effect equals to F, the cause, divided by something intrinsic to objects, which is their mass. So it should really be written as A equal to F over MA, but people write it F equals to MA because that's a practical way it presents itself. So that's the second law. The third law now says, what happens if I have more than an object? Well, I have two possibilities. If this more than two objects, they do interact or they don't interact. If they don't interact, then I can resolve each and every one of them either to the first law or the second law. But if they do interact, the third law is invoked in this case and it states the following, that if this objects interact, they do so in such a way, if one exerts a force on the other, the other exerts a force that is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Now, uh, the, the promise is that if you understand these three laws, of course, there is a tool we use, which is called the free body diagram, which is the force diagram sometimes referred to, is uh, you have to isolate each and every one of these objects, basically, by removing everything that is uh, appended to it or attached to it. All the forces and everything, I mean, all the objects are removed and you are, now you have an object by itself. But before you free this object, before you remove the extra objects that are appended to it, you really have to replace them with their effects. So at the end, you're going to have their forces. Now you have a sum of forces and it becomes an algebra, basically going back to either the first law or the second law to solve your problems. So that's basically how the process works. I mean, uh, 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 the recipe or the algorithm, if you wish, of how to do really problems in physics. So where you solve problems in physics is you isolate each and every one of the objects. You're doing what is called the free body diagram. Now you have the object free by itself. Only appended to it are all the forces, which are the actions of everything else that we removed. And then uh, we do the algebra, okay? We do the math. If, somebody, if we can do it, we just hand it to a mathematician and he do the math for us or put it to a computer. Nowadays, everything is on a computer. So basically, that's the process we do things with. And the question was, and it's still, why then bother with something past this three laws? Since the assumption is we can do them, so why do we have to bother ourselves with anything past this point? In other words, we really have 
to answer a motivation for why, for example, today we're going to be learning about the momentum. So in what context the momentum fits in this picture, okay? Let me give you the scenario for where this one, this concept is needed now, while we have to do today's class, okay? Imagine the following. Two objects, object one, fully described with the Newton's laws, all three of them working on it, okay, beautifully. We have no problem with it. Object two, fully described with Newton's laws, all three of them working at it to make it work, okay? Now, these two objects, they come together and they stick. Now the mass, first of all, I had two objects, now all of a sudden I have one. And the mass of the new one is the sum of the other two masses. During that process of sticking, something happened in there that we need to explain it. So an implosion in this case needs, because we cannot describe it in terms of the velocity and f equals to ma, because that m now is not constant. You guys understand that? The m now, which was m by itself and another m by itself, now all of a sudden became an m plus an m, two m's together. So that's a collision, that's a, that's a case of an implosion. The case of the explosion also is similar. For example, you have a, you have a, you have a, a, let's not call it a bomb, for example, a cup of water, a cup of uh, 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 glass in your hand, and then you drop it. All pieces fly all over the place now. Each and every one of them will decide to go in one direction or the other, depending on the initial state of the cup itself. So each and every one of these pieces needs a description after and before. So there is, a, there is an event in here that has two different states completely, an after and a before, and that event is during that moment, okay? So you either have an explosion or you have a, uh, an, uh, an implosion, and both of them are similar cases of what is called a collision. A quantity that emerges off of this that really is needed to account for all of this is not the velocity, is not the mass, but the combination of the two. In other words, the mass times velocity now becomes a quantity to describe motion. And this very same f equals to ma, you will see clearly that it's going to be stated differently, okay, in terms of this new concept. We're going to call it impulse momentum. So now we're going to rephrase uh, Newton's laws in terms of this new concept with the idea that mass can actually change. When, for example, a... a uh, a rocket takes off during the blast off when it's uh, trying to, l l l during the lift off. During that stage, it's losing mass constantly, basically burning fuel. And the fuel is ejected in the form of gases. And the rocket combination, basically load and, uh, and, uh, and uh, fuel, is losing constantly, basically, mass. At some point, all the fuel is consumed. And at that point, the, the, the containers of the fuel are separated from the load. And at that, from that point on, we're talking about an object again that doesn't change mass. But during the stage where it's taking off, M is not constant. I cannot say F equals to MA will be enough for me to describe the problem because I don't know. M is changing with time, depending on the rate of, uh, of combustion inside the, 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 the rocket engine itself. So basically there is a process here that now we need to account for them and what I'm saying in here is that all we need is the momentum. The momentum will be enough, basically. And we still can go back to uh, uh, Newton's laws then if we introduce the concept of momentum. So in other words, there is a new phenomenon in physics that need to be described using Newton's laws, hopefully without inventing any new laws. That's basically what you do in science in general. As a scientist, you hope that with all of the laws that you have describe everything. Okay, and that's what we said up to this point, we could do everything with the Newton's laws. But we, I just described a few examples that this laws seem to be, there is a problem with them. So hopefully with the introduction of what's just a new concept, which we're going to do today, we can go back to them. We don't abandon them. We don't say just because we're doing collisions or we're doing implosions or uh, uh, explosions or we're doing, for example, uh, rockets taking off or something with masses changing or, for example, you have uh, 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 the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, when, when they load sand, for example, or they load, the, lo load stuff, uh, the, there is the sand that comes in on the belt, uh, the conveyor belt, for example, and that sand is con constantly being added to the conveyor belt 
And is that case, the mass is changing in here and there is problems with the energy and momentum and everything else. So if, 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 if we are going to introduce this new concept, the, the thing with it is, we hope, and that's what we're going to do today, by the introduction of the concept of momentum, we can go back to Newton's laws and still work with them, okay? By doing some minor modifications and we're in business. That is the motivation for this topic, at least for the momentum. But at least one of you is wondering now, after we study this phenomenon, we're in good shape and we seem to have done it with the momentum. So why in the world do we go past then chapter six? So we need to answer that, tie, that question when we come back to chapter six. You guys understand the challenge now? Because I claim that Newton's laws are all we need and we just came up with a new situation when we need something else to resolve these problems. And I promise that the momentum will resolve it. So after we do this, then we need another motivation for why chapter seven is needed and beyond. Yes, does it sound like a good plan? So let me answer the question first of all in typing in here. So we need to describe uh, cases when mass changes. So that's why the challenge today is there. This is why we need to go beyond the, uh, the uh, chapter five. This is why we're doing chapter six. And the answer to that is basically we're going to introduce the concept of momentum and appended to the momentum, there is another kind of concept that is going to be uh, connected to it, which is called impulse. So the momentum impulse combination will answer this question today. Okay. Yes, Taryn is asking, is this one of our answers for the discussion? Yes, absolutely. So this is item one in the discussion. So when you go today to the discussion, the motivation for the topic is as written out there. We need to describe cases when mass changes. It's not constant. You can cite the example, for example, of an implosion or an explosion or a blast off, for example, of a, of a rocket where masses change or the conveyor belt example. All of these changes or, for example, two skaters coming together and they join hands or they were joining hands and they push one another. So all of these situations can be described with momentum. And the promise is, the answer to the question is, if we introduce the concept of momentum and impulse, we don't need to invent new laws to describe these situations. We can still live with the three laws of Newton, provided we introduce these new concepts. So that's the answer to question one today from the discussion that is going to ensue after the chapter. You might have other questions. We're going to see them. Does everybody understand the challenge? Okay, I have two people. I hope the others, since there are three, since everybody else seems to be... Okay, very good. Everybody now, it seems like they're on board. Okay, so this is challenge number one. So we're going to start the slides. Let me find them first. Okay. So this is chapter six, and it talks all about momentum. And actually, momentum and impulse, I just made that at the point. They go hand in hand. Momentum, if you wish, is the instantaneous value of the combination mass velocity. Because since velocity can change because F equals to MA, but now so as M because of the situation I was describing. So when I take the product of mass velocity, now that is what quantify the motion. That is what describes motion, okay? It's not velocity by itself. Remember I said a long time ago when we started this class that motion is velocity. In light of what we know today, actually motion is momentum. So that's the concept that's going to be uh, emerge. In the case when mass is constant, that's fine because constant time and velocity is momentum. Mass doesn't change, so we don't care for it. So momentum and mass will be, momentum and velocity will be uh, uh, equivalent to describe uh, the motion. But in the case when mass actually can change, in the case when two masses come together or they split, then in this situation, we really have to talk about momentum, which is a combination of mass velocity, okay? You have a bug coming with on the freeway, and then you have a truck hitting it. Uh, according to the action-reaction principle, both of them suffer, uh, are subject to the same force. They collide with the absolutely the same force. 
but you can understand what's going on to the bug versus what's going on to the uh, to the uh, to the truck. Both of them suffer the same change in uh, same, uh, same impulse, but one of them will have more damage than the other because again, at that point, is the acceleration that matters. Actually, the front of the bug will uh, basically miss its back, and the truck will be basically uh, unchanged as far as this whole thing. But that's basically a situation that can be described also with its collision. Okay, the um, impulse turned out to be just the change in momentum. Initial momentum and final momentum take the difference, final minus initial, that is the impulse. So the impulse and momentum are interconnected. One of them is an instantaneous value and the other one is a change, the difference between them. That's one way of defining it. Using Newton's law, that's why we said that we're not going to abandon them completely. We will find an alternative uh, 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 explanation for the impulse, which turned out to be the time, I mean the force, multiplied by the time it applies to. So if you apply a force over a long period of time, that is going to generate more impulse than the same force applied over a shorter period of time. In other words, the force applied over an extended period of time will generate a big difference in change in momentum. In initial momentum, final momentum, there will be a big gap between them. You gain a lot of momentum that way. Or, of course, if you're, uh, if you're stopping, you, you drain a lot of momentum from the system that way. So that is the impulse momentum connection. It's connected to the momentum, but also it's connected to the force in a sense, the force and how long it has been applied. Case in point, the cannon and the cannonball. The longer the barrel, the more it takes for the same force. Remember the force resulting that to push the cannon ball for, through the barrel of the cannon is coming from the chemical reaction, which is just basically whatever, how many pounds of powder you have in the, in, the, in, the, in the combustion chamber, basically. So if you have one pound, that's just one pound, whether the barrel is small or uh, long, doesn't matter. So whether the barrel is short or long, doesn't matter. But if the barrel is long, the same force that there is also off of that thrust is going to continue for a long time being applied. So it's going to gain through it a longer, a bigger, Momentum, in other words, when the cannonball emerges, is going to emerge with a higher velocity in this case, or momentum, it's the same thing, okay? Because momentum in this case, is just the mass of the cannonball time is its velocity. But the entire system, cannonball and uh, cannon, is actually, uh, it's an explosion in this case. Whatever happened in the chemical reaction was an internal force. So the cannon will recoil, and the cannonball will travel forward, and that's basically the result of that thing there. So, and there is, you started with no uh, momentum because the cannon, cannonball initially was stationary <coughs> and the cannonball will travel forward and to compensate for it, the cannon will tra travel backward and both of them will have the same momenta. One of them will be a positive value. The other one will be a negative value. One of them, since it has a big mass, namely the cannon, will have very little velocity, so the recoil motion is very little compared to the cannon ball, which has less mass, hence bigger mom uh, momentum and uh, bigger, bigger velocity, because again, the product of mass times velocity is the same for both quantities. And they add up to zero again, okay? Because initially, the cannon ball and cannon were stationary. So that is where the concept is. And so the impulse changes momentum, that is what I was saying about. Bouncing, that's another concept. And conservation of momentum, this is one of the most fundamental laws that we're going to discover in this chapter. This is as important as F equals to MA. But as a matter of fact, derived off of F equals to MA. Okay? When we're doing other physics, I mean, when we do, uh, for example, relativity and other concepts, quantum mechanics especially, we don't have a position to be de defined at all. But in that case, we still talk about momentum, for example, of the electron and the momentum of the uh, alpha particle, for example. And that is a concept that can be measured in the laboratory, okay? So this goes way beyond this class, okay? The concept of uh, momentum and its conservation, I'm sorry, the conservation of momentum goes way beyond. I mean, this is, it's rooted in here. It starts from here. But this is one of the most important laws of nature, okay? This is actually explains the solar system, why the solar system the w is the way it looks, why the entire galaxy has the shape it has. It's because of a conservation 
of a concept related to the uh, momentum, which is called the angular momentum. But again, it's rooted here. This is where, it's, where you can find it. It's in this place. So the entire solar system and its shape, the fact that all of the planets are on the same plane, basically moving with the sun, the, the, all of the, 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 the flattened shape of the entire galaxy, with the except of the bulge inside its center, the entire galaxy has this shape. Why? Because of a concept related to this one that you guys are exploring today in chapter six. See how beautiful this thing is? I mean, you start with simple stuff, and now you can talk about the universe, you can talk about the galaxy, something that is beyond basically the classroom size and anything, and you can explain it just with simple ideas that we can emerge from this one in here. That is amazing. That is, um, no matter how much I do this class and talk about it, no matter what level we do that, especially if we have, I mean, it's really nice, I mean, to be able to be sitting. Very tiny creature we are, humans, on this planet, on a very, very small planet in the solar system that is a thousandth the size of, a, of, a, of, a, of a Jupiter, negligible compared to almost anything in the solar system, looking at this galaxy where our sun actually is a fraction, tiny fraction, a dust in this big, basically, uh, 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 ocean of stars, looking at this galaxy, looking at this universe, and be able to explain it, just empowered with the concepts that we have developed so far in this class. We are in chapter six. Okay. That's nice, isn't it? You guys agree? Do you guys agree? Okay. <laughs> Very good. I think you should be proud of yourselves, honestly. To be able to state these things and to be witnessing it and to understand it, no matter what you can, I mean, this is really amazing. Honestly, no matter what you do, no matter where you come from, no matter what your major is going to be, just with the simple concepts, we can understand the solar system. We can understand the, at least the shape. I mean, there are more things going on in there, but at least the shape of the solar system and the shape of the galaxy. Okay. We're going to talk about collisions. Okay. Collisions, of course, like billiard, billiards, for example, when people play billiards, you can basically do the math and find where things go and things like that. But actually, it has far more reaching than far more effects than that. For example, for me to understand temperature and what's going on in this room with the gas and all of that, I really have to invo invoke collision in here. So it has applications in there. In order, for example, to understand the structure of nucleus, for example, we have to really collide two nuclei against one another and see what these things they spill against one another. So the collision plays a major role also in research and also in understanding what's going on around us. Okay, and then we explore other collisions and things like that. But of course, we're going to take it uh, sample cases in this case. We're going to introduce these concepts, but they are the foundation for a lot of things. So did I make the case for chapter six or not? Are you guys convinced that we can continue today? Okay, very good. So we can continue, okay? I'm asking your permission because I really have to respect your opinions in here. It's not just I... Uh, I'm doing it for because I really want you guys to appreciate the fact that this is not just needed, but it actually achieves something, okay? So, again, momentum is a property of moving things, just like I said earlier. This is the definition, if you wish, okay? This is how we define it. Uh, historically, it's defined by taking basically more objects next to one another and start uh, basically applying Newton's laws, and all of a sudden you will see the combination mass times velocity emerge from that. And it is related to something in, in mathematics, actually, not in physics, called the center of mass. Okay? When we do the center of mass, that is when this thing appears there. Basically, if I take two objects or three objects or more than two, basically any number you wish, and uh, work... Uh, Newton's laws, all three of them, they have to be invoked. The first one that has to be invoked is the third law, actually. And then the next one, we combine them. At the end, the system of more than a single object appear to be that of a single object, whose mass is the sum of all of the masses, and whose location is that of the center of mass. And each one of those basically comes weighted 
the center of mass is the weighted average of the position of the different particles. And the velocity of the center of mass is the weighted velocity of all of the other uh, masses. Hence, since it's weighted and it's weighted by the masses, actually the mass times velocity one, mass times velocity mass, and so on and so forth, the combination comes from that concept. And for somebody who doesn't know what you're doing up to that point, thinks all you're doing is back to Newton's second law of motion. But no, you're doing it actually for multiple inter interacting objects if you invoke the concept of momentum. So that's really how the beauty of it is. So you take an object one, object two, object three. These are real tangible objects with masses. M mass, mass one, mass two, and mass three combined, okay? And they are moving or and they're subject to external forces and everything. And you separate them using the third law of Newton and you find the mass of the, uh, the F equals to MA for the first one, F equals to M2A for the second one, uh, and so on and so forth. And you add the, this equation algebraically, what you find is the following. This three masses in my example can be replaced only with one object. Here is the object. It's located there, okay? Whose mass is the sum of the masses and whose position is a fictitious position, an imaginary position, which is a, uh, called the center of mass, okay? Okay? And whose equation actually looks like that of the second law of Newton. So if somebody walks in after you reach this point in the, in the, in the, in the discussion, they would say, oh, you're still doing second law of Newton. But you're not. You're actually doing a multiple objects whose position is weighted by their masses and whose velocities are weighted by their uh, masses. And hence, when you do the mass times velocity for the entire system, which is this big mass times its velocity, that's of the center of mass, is going to be the mass of the first one times its own velocity, the mass of the second one times its own velocity, the mass of the third one times its own velocity, and that's where the momentum concept emerges from. Okay, so that's basically why mass times moment, uh, velocity is a new quantity now that we need to, uh, to, uh, to deal with. And that's how the con that concept of momentum emerges. In terms of measuring it, it's easy. All you have to do is measure the velocity. You measure position one, position two, at time one, time two, take the ratio of the two different velocity, uh, to the different positions, I'm sorry, with the, the respect of the difference in time, that is velocity for each and every one of these objects. You take the masses and you put them on scale, for example, and you have the masses do the, the, the product of the two, and now all of a sudden you have the mass, you have the momentum of that particle. Now, in terms of the units, the units is the units of the, ma uh, the mass, which is kilogram, times the units of the velocity, which is ma a meter per second, and you're done. So that's basically the units, kilogram, meter per second, and it's a measurable quantity. So it's a real physical quantity. Again, this is just a, uh, an example in here. Uh, a moving boulder has more momentum than a stone rolling at the same speed. Okay, a big object and a small object provided moving both of them with the same speed, okay? 50 miles per hour, 50 miles per hour. You have a small car, okay? And a big truck, both of them moving 50 miles per hour, obviously the truck in this case would do more damage, carries more momentum in it because of its mass. Okay, that's one thing. Then uh, a fast boulder has more momentum than a slow boulder. Now, if two objects have the same size, but one of them has bigger velocity than the other one, the object with the bigger velocity now wins because they have the same masses. And any uh, object at rest has no momentum because it has no velocity. So that's why the combination now, mass and velocity is important. It's not just mass by itself, it's not velocity by itself, it's the combination of the two. Hence, the momentum is mass times velocity. The symbol, by the, moment, by the way, for momentum is the letter P, okay? So that's the, if you see this expression, that's what that means, okay? Of course, we're not going to deal with the symbolism, but just I'm giving you that so that if you're reading somewhere and you find P, that is what they mean by it, okay? Okay. A moving object has, of course, momentum because... Part of the momentum is V. The moving object, of course, has energy because the energy is also proportional to the velocity squared, actually. And this one is, a, both of them are valid, okay? And it also has a speed. 
because this is actually a vector. The momentum is actually a vector because it has a direction. And the speed is the magnitude of that vector. Of course, that's true. Okay, that's what the velocity is. So it has all of this. Okay, so the correct answer are all of the above. When the speed doubles, of course, the momentum doubles. Again, it's proportional to V. I hope this is obvious by now because V times, so if you started with 50 miles per hour times a, a ton and double the speed to 100 miles per hour, now you have already 100 miles per hour times the ton, which is twice as much momentum as you started with, okay? When you double the mass, the same thing also, it doubles too. Okay, in addition to that, like I said, the impulse actually is related, and we're gonna see it in the impulse uh, momentum uh, theorem, uh, is the force times the uh, time. This is the impulse, okay? Again, the force, how long it's been applied, time is its time, which is the time it's been applied to. That is a concept of uh, impulse. The symbol for impulse is the letter J, which is FT. Okay, so again, if you're looking at the, uh, some literature and you see it, this is what the symbol for it is. So if not, don't care, don't worry, it's no big deal, okay? Especially if you're not going to do, be doing uh, any kind of teaching physics later on or something like that. Unless if you're going to high school or middle school, you need to know what your students are talking about. Here is what I was talking about. The impulse is the change in momentum. This delta, whenever you see it, it means change. Okay, so the impulse is the change in momentum. This equation is actually equivalent to F equals to MA. Okay, with the, with the exception that Neo, now this accounts for the fact that the mass can change. So this fully describes the situation we're in today and the situation we were in on uh, Tuesday in the sense that this expression accounts for the new situation that allows for the mass to change. Because when I say change, I don't mean necessarily change in velocity. It could be change in mass too. So if the mass now grows or shrinks, now this expression takes care of it. That is either uh, uh, an explosion, the mass now all of a sudden is lost, at least the part that we're tra tracking, and or we add more mass to it, or in the case, for example, of the rocket, the example, the mass can be changing, or the velocity itself is changing, or both of them. As a matter of fact, for the rocket, both of them are happening at the same time. Okay, the rocket is gaining speed, so its velocity is changing, and in the same time, it's losing mass. The mass that is uh, uh, basically in the combustion that is escaping through uh, in the form of gas. So in that case, both of them are happening. The change in that is coming from two forces, basically they work against one another, which is the force of thrust coming from the engine pushing against the gases. So that's uh, an upward force, and the force of gravity, of course, trying to drag your, your rocket down, so that's basically how this rocket works. So rocket science is not really complicated, okay? So I know always they give the example with it, but this is, can be described, can describe it beautifully. This expression can describe it perfectly. So the greater the impulse exerted on something, the greater the change in momentum. That is what this means. And change in here is the letter delta. MV is momentum and FT, I just called it impulse. So this is the impulse momentum theorem, actually it's called, and it's equivalent to F equals to MA, it's equivalent to Newton's laws. So when the force that produces an impulse acts for twice as much time, the impulse then in this case doubles. Again, you have, this is what the impulse is, the time now is doubled. So instead of five seconds, it's 10 seconds, now, the force is going to be uh, doubled. Again, the units, I did not mention something about the units. The units of the, imp uh, the impulse are the same the units for, the, uh, for uh, momentum, which were, if you guys remember, kilogram meter per second. Or alternatively, and it's true also for the momentum, the impulse is a Newton second. It's conveniently always to talk Newton second for an impulse, and for momentum, we say kilogram meter per second. And both of these units are the same. This one and this one are exactly the same. So if you're doing a lab experiment or if you see somebody talking about impulse and momentum and they give you this quantity or that quantity and sometimes they refer to it in Newton second or kilogram meter per second, 
they mean the same thing. Both of them are the same. Equivalent units, okay? Unit, Newton actually is a derived unit. It's not a fundamental unit, but uh, kilogram is a fundamental unit. Me a meter is a, a, a fundamental unit. Second is a fundamental unit. So in terms of fundamental units, this is correct, but this was just called in, term, in honor of Mr. Newton because the force is expressed in terms of Newton. So again, to answer the question, it doubles. Okay. So impulse change. Uh, so again, this is just examples. Apply force for a. Uh, oops. Did I? Did I go back too far? Okay. Increasing momentum. Apply the. So in order to increase the momentum, you have two choices: either put more powder inside the uh, the the gun, basically inside the cannon. But if you can't do that because it contains only so much, then make the force apply for a longer time by, for example, extending the barrel, okay? But then you will probably deal with the force of friction which is going to slow you down. But then if the, the, the power is high enough, so it's going to overcome it and the, cannon, the cannonball will come, uh, come out faster. So those are your two choices, okay? Either have higher force or have, uh, have, uh, have a longer time of application of the force. Okay, one of the two should result, or both. Okay, if you can do both, that's going to be fine too. That would result in a higher change in momentum. Delta will be higher. Of what? Of MV. Okay. Is there any questions so far? Okay, here is the example I've been talking about now since day one. Probably forever. Okay. So the example says a cannonball shot from a cannon with a long barrel will emerge with a greater speed because the cannonball receives a greater what? Average force? No. The force is absolutely the same thing. Okay. Impulse? Yes. Okay. So the correct answer should be B, impulse. Okay. Okay, very good. Yes, yeah, so it should be B. Okay, thank you. Because again, I just argue the fact that the force is coming from whatever you have in the chamber there. So, decreasing momentum over a long time extend the time during what mo momentum is reduced. So again, you're, you're, you're going with a change, but this change is negative, okay? This change is a negative value. So the car was moving, for example, uh, 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 for a, uh, how should I call it? With a high speed and you want to bring it to a stop, okay? And you can only afford a certain amount of, uh, uh, a certain amount of force or something, and you don't want the force to be too high or something. So in this case, make T high. So in other words, delta, of mv equals to force times time, force is little, you want the delta mv to be the same. So time better be high, okay? So extend the time for the effect so that there is less force. You don't damage things. You don't damage a car, okay? Instead of a car coming to a sudden stop, for example, with the wall, uh, make it uh, take a long time, okay, to come to a stop because the brakes are out, okay? That's why you have those ramps on the uh, outside of the freeway. For the trucks, have you guys seen them? Do you guys have you ever had a chance to look and see those things? To drive in an area where they say uh, a runaway. If you're going to Vegas, I think there are a couple of them. Yes, for runaway trucks. Yeah, because they cannot break. So they could have opted for another solution, and that is to put a wall. Okay, for runaway truck, there is this wall. Go and hit it. Do you think that's smart? <laughs> No, you're right, Jeff. Okay, that would be genius. Okay, no. Okay, you guys understand? They have those runaway because then there is a friction with the with the sand and all of that, and ultimate, and there is actually an uphill for the truck to come to a stop. Okay, especially coming from downhill, you'll see them a lot in places, especially where they're on the outside of the cities where they have those uh, ramps for the. Uh... <laughs> yes. Okay. Yep, on the grip one, very good. So uh, that's really the same thing. This is what the idea is in here, okay? You don't want a higher force, so you want actually the time to be longer or to, to bring it to a stop, okay? 
And this is the example for the hay, I think. A fast moving car hitting a haystack or hitting a cement wall produces vastly different results. Do both experience the same change in momentum? If you want them to stop, yes, okay? If you want the car to stop, yes. So put a lot of hay there, it's going to stop it. Put a cement there also, it's going to stop it, okay? Do both cars uh, have experienced the same impulse? They should be, yes, okay? So they should, because they were moving, and now they are not. It's the same car, okay? So the correct answer should be B. Yes, for all three. What is the three? Oh, there is a third one in here. Do both experience the same force? No, because one of them with the haystack will have a longer time for it to stop versus the wall, which will have a sudden time, so which have less time to stop, so will experience a higher force to account for that little time. So the correct answer is B. Okay. Did you correct it? Okay, okay. Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, these questions are tricky and that's what gets you off on those quiz, quizzes, guys. You have to pay attention to the questions. Sometimes even a person knows the correct answer, but when they read the question, they don't, uh, sometimes it's kind of, uh, verse, I mean, against what you thought was possible. And if uh, somebody explained the question better or you had more time to read it, which brings me to another point, guys. Are you guys having enough time to do the quiz? Because I know that I need to extend it for another class. Are the quizzes uh, having a good time or you guys need to... Uh... I, I, will, I will revise yeah, this one. I think just a little bit more time. Yeah, because I think about a minute is not proper. It's like a minute and like maybe seven, six seconds for each question, yeah. question especially yeah. for... Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll revise that upward for you guys too because they complain the same thing. And honestly, I was thinking about it too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, which is the case in here? Somebody could have the D in here because they just rushed through the question. And sometimes it happened with the best of us. So it's not. Uh, okay. Here's one of the questions that you guys are going to do uh, for tonight too. This is one of the discussion questions. Remember, we already had one, and that is the motivation for today's topic. And this one is, when a dish falls with the uh, change of mom in momentum, be less. If it lands on carpet, then if it lands on a hard floor. They have the same momentum. Remember, the dish fell from the same height and reached the floor, and it stopped in either case. So the change in momentum is the same. But one of them will experience Longer time, basically, if you have it on a soft car uh, carpet, for example, it's probably not going to break because the force will be spread over a long time. So the force will be less in this case than if you have it on a hard floor. Hard floor will be sudden. So the change in momentum will be the same amount. But the time now makes a difference. The impulse is absolutely the same thing. So the correct answer should be both have the same. Yes, yeah, so the correct answer is A. So again, in the discussion later on, you're going to put either no, both are the same because you have in here when a dish falls, will, will, will the change in momentum be less if it lands on a carpet than if it lands on a hard floor because it's the same dish, the same height, landing on two different surfaces. One of them is hard and one of them is soft. Of course, it's going to suffer more damage on the hard one because it will have a, a higher force, less time. But the momentum, the change in momentum is going to be the same thing because it was moving, now it's not. Okay? So the final momentum is zero. The initial momentum, whatever the mass of the disc is, let's say, for example, it's 100 grams, okay, 0 0.1 kilogram, and moving, let's say, for example, the sake of argument at 2 meters per second, or let's give it a higher speed, 20 meters per second. So the change in momentum in either case is 2 kilogram meter per second. In my example, okay, I said that it's 100 grams, which is 0 0.1 kilogram, uh, moving at 20 meters per second, coming from a decent height. And then uh, uh, remember, if, uh, if it comes at uh, after flying for two seconds, each second it's gaining 10 meter per second per second. So it's been flying for 20 seconds, for two seconds, I'm sorry. So if it was two seconds height, you drop it, it's going to be 20 meter per second, okay? That's the free fall. And uh, mass of 100 grams, so it's gonna reach the ground at two kilogram meter per second regardless. 
Okay? You don't have to put numbers. All you have to do is put A. But you should have an understanding of what that is. Yes? Okay. I did the algebra already. We don't need the distance. Oh, 30 meters. That's too high. One half times uh, five, no, five times four. No, oh, it should be only 20 meters, no? 20 meters high. That doesn't matter. Don't put numbers, okay? Okay, this is the example I gave earlier. This is a truck actually with the haste. Again, it's coming with a velocity and V now force is less, time is longer for it to stop. And now force is higher, time is short. So now more damage to the truck. Same thing with this boxer, okay? Same thing in here with this, uh, with this uh, girl in here. She had to hit hard very quick in order to produce higher momentum to cause more damage in here. Okay, when an object bounces off, in this case, the momentum is going to be greater because here is an object. Here's the wall, for example. It was moving this way, and it hits the wall and bounces off. So the change in momentum is the final momentum. Let's call it mv, okay? And the initial momentum is negative mv, okay? Let's call this one uh, whatever that is. Let's... It's, it bounced off, so it's a negative mv. It's moving in this direction. So the change in momentum is mv, and if you guys have had any kind of algebra, you will know that minus times minus is going to be plus. So the change in momentum in here twice mv versus if it hits the wall and stick to it, or falls to, uh, right there, that is going to just be mv by itself because zero minus mv is zero uh, is basically uh, mv only. But in this case, if it bounces off, it's going to be twice as much. So this is trickier. So if, if you hit something and you bounce off of it, that means that you have, have suffered far more uh, 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 damage in this case than if you just hit it or continue forward. So if, for example, a car and a truck hit one another, during the, let's say, for example, they're traveling both 50 miles per hour, they will hit one another and the truck will actually push the car in the opposite direction. So the car, not only it stopped, but actually moving backward. So in this case, from the vantage point of the car itself only, it has a higher change in uh, momentum than that of the truck. So the truck in this case will suffer less damage because from its vantage point, it's received less uh, change in momentum. But overall, in this case, the momentum will be the same. I mean, the initial momentum before the collision and the final momentum is going to be the same thing. It's not gonna change during this process. Okay, this is the example we talked about. So I'm just going to go quickly in here, if you guys don't mind. Conservation of momentum, I just stated it, basically. This is an important concept, the, the momentum before. Oops. Oh, this thing went out. The momentum before is the same thing as the momentum after. Somebody might be asking before what and after what. Anything, it doesn't matter. Before the collision, after the collision is the standard way what we mean by it. But even during any process, before and after, as a matter of fact, the before and the after are just semantics. Actually, the before can be the after and the after can be the, the before. So just whenever you count it, it doesn't matter whether in the past or the future. In other words, for example, during the collision of uh, particles in uh, nuclear reactors, what they do, they took the after picture and they predict the state of the object before. So that's, uh, so they, you can use it to predict the past or to predict the future, okay? That is the conservation of momentum. There are two types, here is the statement that I was talking uh, before. There are two types of collisions. There is uh, elastic collisions Elastic collision occurs when colliding objects rebound without last, uh, lasting deformation or any generation of the heat. If you take, for example, a ball, basketball or football, and you drop it, during the stage while it's dropping, it has the shape of a spherical shape. 
when it hits the ground, actually it deforms a little bit. It hits the ground, it deforms a little bit. And then as it rebounds, it regains its shape more or less. If you do the experiment, I don't have any balls I need to try this thing with. If you do the experiment, usually the second height is a little less than the first one and the third one and so on and so forth until it comes to a stop. This is not an elastic collision. An elastic collision will happen so that there is no change in the shape because during the change of the shape, there is loss of energy during that time, in addition to the fact that it's in the, with the air, which causes also to lose energy. It hits the ground and bounces off the ground to the same height. This is called a pure elastic collision. In other words, the key word in here is the kinetic energy before is the same as the kinetic energy after. That is really the word to use for, uh, for an uh, elastic collision. Elastic collision is the one that does not have losses in energy of the kinet kinetic energy. It produces no sound. Of course, that's not true for the case of a basketball or a, a soccer ball. They produce sound. Sound carries with it energy. So it takes from the energy of the system. They don't produce heat, okay? That is also another case where, 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 where uh, uh, this is not true because any collision has heat in it. It doesn't matter how elastic it is. I mean, if you don't trust me, go tomorrow to your favorite de dealership. Does anybody know what is the best cars out there now that you like? Any idea? Toyota? That's what I have, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody else? The Toyotas are not expensive. I want something expensive, okay? Anybody else? Okay, Bentley is good. Okay, I like uh, Kyle's suggestion. Bentley. Bentley or anybody else for, for that matter. Tesla is probably not that expensive compared to the Bentley. Or is it? I don't know. I don't know much about those things. Okay, I have a Toyota. My wife has a Toyota too. Anyway, go to a Bentley dealership tomorrow. Okay, if you don't think that there is heat. I'm just trying to argue that there is heat. Grab two of them, not just one. And have them collide at 100 miles per hour. And you can have your breakfast, I guarantee you. You can put eggs on top of them and it works. You can do your breakfast that way. Anyone is for it? No? Okay, if you can't go for the Tesla, for the Bentleys, do the Teslas. Grab two Teslas tomorrow and hit them, collide them one against one another, and you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's going to be a very expensive breakfast, Kyle. Okay. <laughs> Very is it because of the friction that yeah, they experience the when they're going at 100 miles per hour? Yeah, the friction, uh, heat is always involved because you're right. I mean, when they collide, there is that friction, but also the material itself deforms. And as it deforms while it's moving in and out, there is heat generated. Heat, we'll learn that later on, is related to the motion in this case, okay? So the particles as they move, I mean, you can do this. Rub your hands against one another and you will feel heat, okay? Do it right now and you feel them warm. And that's what people do when it's super cold in the morning. I mean, uh, not nowadays because it's hot. But when the winter, they do that, that's because heat is coming from that. So that's exactly what's happened in this case for the two Bentleys. If you can't afford two Bentleys, please don't do this experiment, okay? I'm suggesting that, okay? I don't is want to. More, is more heat uh, generated on impact or is it all beforehand? Uh, it's during impact, okay? The faster the objects were moving, the more heat is generated, okay? For, for example, think of those uh, meteorites that come to the, uh, to the Earth. When they do, they actually burn, okay? Because of the friction that they have with the, with the, uh, with the atmosphere, okay? So with the faster, the higher the speed, the more uh, heat you're going to generate that way. Okay, I think we're almost there now. So this is elastic collision. Inelastic collision is the opposite. Uh, let me say something about elastic collision. They are ideal. They don't exist in real life. 
That's my point. Earlier, the examples with the basketball or the, with the soccer ball, they don't exist in real life. There is always something called coefficient of restitution. Now, some cases, they are very close from being uh, elastic. Case in point, for example, the room that you are in right now, it has a lot of particles moving around in it, the particles of the atmosphere, the air. Those particles, they are colliding with one another and with the wall. Then when your skin with extreme velocity, with high velocity, but they're so tiny that all of their collisions, you can do an experiment to an, a tremendous accuracy and you will find them that they behave like elastically, they're elastic collisions, okay? So there is, to some extent, they exist in life, but as a very, very high uh, uh, approximation because they work very well. I mean, you can safely say that in the room you're sitting in, it's bombarded every which way that you can think of with elastic collisions. The collisions mainly happen between you and the particles or the particles and the walls of the room or any obstacle they have in the room, okay? So that's basically how you can explain temperature. The faster they move, the hotter the room gets. If you put the AC on, then they move slower, okay? So that's basically how the collisions. So that's the word of warning in here. As a matter of fact, even the inelastic collision, which is the opposite in this case, uh, kinetic energy is not conserved, then in this case, it's also an ideal situation. Occurs when colliding objects results in deformation or the generation of heat, okay? And that is, for example, the collision I was talking about earlier. That is actually an inelastic collision because if you look at the shape of the cars, they don't stay the same after the collision. They change. And the heat is an example of them. Uh, for example, two cars moving and they collide and they stick one another. In the lab, if when we do the lab, usually we use Velcros. We have two cars coming and they collide and the Velcros will ensure that they actually stick to one another. So that's in this case, it's an inelastic collision. To, to simulate an inelastic collision in a lab, we use magnets with the same polarity facing one another. In other words, a North Pole and North Pole repel, so the cars, as they get closer, they repel one another. So we use that so that they don't touch or they don't cause any, any, any harm. So this is how we do it in the lab, in actual uh, lab instruction. Again, for some of you who are taking physics 11, we we're going to do collisions, okay? So we'll do it and we're going to simulate that, okay? Uh, so again, this is an example of an elastic collision, single car moving at 10 miles per hour collides with a car of mass M. So in this case, the conservation of uh, momentum will give you the, uh, the value of the momentum before and the momentum after. And from here, So they are moving, so the conservation of momentum. So you can use the conservation of momentum in this case to find what the velocity is, okay? Okay, uh, ignore this one. This is, you only have two assignments for today, okay? Remember the questions. So freight cars A is moving toward an identical freight car B that is at rest when they collide both freight cars uh, coupled together. There is actually a, a, a thing to hold them together. Compared with the initial speed of the freight car A, what happened to the speed of the new car? Well, in this case, both of them have identical freights. They are actually identical, similar masses. And one of them was moving, the other one was stationary. So when they collide, the new momentum, which is equal to now the twice the mass, times the initial velocity, the, the new velocity that they gain must be equal to the mass times the, so the velocity after times the velocity before. So in this case, cancels the masses. So the velocity after will be half the initial velocity. So the correct answer is B. Okay. Collisions that actually do not only happen in, in, uh, in uh, one dimension, when two cars, for example, on rails or uh, two cars on the freeway or something like that, they can also happen in 2D. And that's the case in point, for example, I was talking about all along, which is billiards, for example, that's a two-dimensional process. Actually, they can happen in three. So geometry can be a little bit more complicated, okay? You have to involve the, uh, the, uh, the 
angle between them and so on and so forth. And the case of the explosion is this one. So again, this is the, uh, the, the chapter for momentum. And it's basically telling you that uh, now we can describe these situations using this momentum and impulse combination. So we can describe all of the situations, okay? So this is in a nutshell your chapter. Please remind me again, I know that I talked to the other class and they did not remind me. If you guys don't see the change for the time for the quizzes, please send me an email by the end of today or tomorrow, okay? And don't forget you have two questions for the day. One of them, the motivations, and the other one, I forgot what it was already. I'm sorry, but hopefully you guys took a note of it because I'm going to... You guys remember what was the other question? Okay, hold on. Let me first of all find the second one because somebody is asking about the first one. Let me first of all find what the second one was. Was it this one? No. Impulse. The second one was A, no, both are the same. I think the answer was A, but I need to remember what it was, the question. Yes, this one. When a dish, remember the dish question, okay? Hits the ground. Uh, both of them have the uh, same change in momentum, but of course the dish can suffer different uh, uh, fates, okay? So that was the second question. The second question is about the dish. If it falls from the same height on uh, two different kinds of surfaces, a carpet or a hard surface, uh, would it have the same momentum? Uh, uh, would it have different momentum? No, it will have the same impulse, basically, the same... Um, change in momentum, okay? So that's the second question. The first question was basically uh, the reason why we have to move forward today is because we want to describe a situation when the mass changes, okay? And for that, we need to introduce two concepts, the mass and impulse, and that accounts for that, for the, uh, for the fact that mass can change, such as the case of a collision, for example, or uh, in the case of an implosion or an explosion. Okay? So, you guys have assignments, you have a homework also, you have quizzes, you have uh, this question, so uh, please pay attention to these things. And do ask questions, don't leave it to, to the end, okay? Make sure that you have your questions. And I'm going to go through the quiz, hopefully tonight, and fix whatever needs need to be fixed in it. For those who are on uh, Physics 11, please make sure you come back at 6 p.m. And uh, be ready to stay until 9 p.m., 9, 10 p.m., okay? Because we have, uh, we have quite a few things to do. And also, I want you guys to work on these things and finish them before we leave. Okay, so if you need to go and get some coffee, get some coffee and come back at six. If not, I'll see you Tuesday, guys. Thank you.